Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Welcome back young friends and everyone joining for this gradual teaching series. We are continuing to look at the Buddha's gradual instructions on danger and sensual pleasures. And today we're looking at the Dhammapada verse, which is Balanakatta Sangutta Vatu. This is Dhammapada verse 26 to 27. And it's the story of the Balanakatta festival. So the Dhammapada commentary tells us that the Buddha was staying at Jetavana Monastery and a festival known as Balanakatta was being celebrated in Savati. During the festival, many foolish young people were celebrating and as part of their revelry, they smeared themselves with ash and cow dung and then went roaming around the city. They shouted at the top of their voices, yelling out and making a general nuisance of themselves around the city. They went as far as pounding on random doors of homes and establishments and they wouldn't stop until they were given money to go away. So at the time there were a great many lay disciples of the Buddha living in Savati. And because of the poor behavior of these foolish young people, they sent word to the Buddha requesting him and the Sangha to keep to the monastery and not to enter the town or the city for seven days. These same lay disciples, they sent alms food to Jethavana Monastery and they also kept their own houses without going into the city. And then on the eighth day when the festival was over, the Buddha and his disciples were invited into the city for alms food and other offerings. And when the lay disciples told him and the Sangha about the vulgar and shameful behavior of the foolish young people during the festival, the Buddha commented that it was in the nature of the foolish and the ignorant to behave shamelessly. Then the Buddha spoke in verse as follows. He says, to engage in negligence is for ignorant and foolish people, while vigilance for the wise is protected as the foremost wealth. Therefore, do not engage in negligence nor be intimate with attachment to sensual pleasures. Being vigilant and meditative, one attains great happiness. This teaching given by the Buddha is a very useful one to us, as are many of the teachings of the Buddha. But this one in particular helps us to look at different aspects of the danger in sensual pleasures. So the danger in doing things which lead us to shameless behavior. There's a couple of aspects that are useful for us to understand in this teaching. And one is the distinction between negligence and vigilance. So we're going to look at that and why the Buddha says people who are negligent, they are ignorant and foolish people. And then why the Buddha says someone who is vigilant is wise. And we'll look at that. The other aspect to it is also around moral shame. And the one that's always linked to that is fear of wrongdoing. So we're going to look at those as two types of qualities of protection is what the Buddha refers to them as and why they are interlinked and so very important to the practice and also why they are the proximate cause for sense restraint. So that's something we touched on in the main session on the danger in sensual pleasures. But in all these things that the Buddha teaches us, there's so many linkings and interworkings and things that the Buddha says, if you do this, it leads to this. If you do this, it's a proximate cause or condition for this. And the Buddha's teaching works in that way that we heed the teaching of the Buddha, we listen to the instructions, and then we go away and check it for ourselves. Is what the Buddha says true? So this is one of those opportunities to do that. Now the Buddha has many stories in the suttas and the idea is that these stories are pointers, pointers and examples for us to use to try and penetrate or fully understand what the Buddha is talking about. So right now there are 
areas where we may think there is no danger in sensual pleasures, there is no danger in having fun. And that may be so for you listening right now. But each opportunity where we talk about the danger in sensual pleasures, it's yet another opportunity to check. And it's a very difficult aspect of the teaching because we all want to have fun. But if you really look at sensual pleasures and the idea of how much we attach to sensual pleasures, we are always seeking fun. We're always seeking opportunities to be happy. But when we're doing so, we don't see the downside of it. The downside being the danger, the degradation, the defilement of when we have fun. And so this story of Balanakatha festival is a very timely and very pointed example because you can see that these particularly young people in the story, foolishly, they smear themselves with things and they go run amok in the town. So much so that the Buddha is asked to stay away from the town. So are the Sangha and the lay people who are disciples of the Buddha, they also steer clear. They keep to their houses. They don't go out. And that's because there are foolish people doing silly things. Now, how this relates to our modern times is very, very similar. It's very similar when you look at what's happening on the internet, what's happening through social media. Have you ever looked on social media or looked even on TV programs and movies and you think that is too much? How can someone do that without feeling ashamed? Are we really to this point of seeing so much one, maybe sexual activity or drunken behavior or drug use or something that appears to be actions that are fueled by drug use? or just behavior that is so odd and so embarrassing, shameful and disgusting at some point. Too much flesh is shown. Maybe someone is very, very young doing these things or someone is very, very old doing these things. And it's something that doesn't seem very seemly. It shocks us. So there are certain things in our modern times that it's worth looking at and worth looking at as examples of behavior that we don't want to do. And so when you're too comfortable doing certain things which are shameful, it's something to really look at. And that's what the Buddha says about not engaging in negligence and not engaging in intimacy with being attached to certain sensual pleasures. Because when that becomes your habit tendency and not a good one, a bad habit tendency, then you run off doing those things and it becomes something that Oh, it's okay to do. But then you don't see that people around you, not the ones who are egging you on, but the people who maybe you have some respect for, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your friends who are a little bit wiser, or maybe it's your teachers or other people that are around you who are not happy with what you're doing. They're worried for you. So this is a story that is one of those examples where we get the opportunity to take a look and you see the interlinking in various aspects of the Buddha's teaching. And so we can look at that today. The sutta that is very helpful to us in terms of where the Buddha talks about dwelling negligently and dwelling vigilantly is called the Pamada Vihari Sutta. This is Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 35, discourse number 97. And it's not a very long sutta, but I'm going to paraphrase what the Buddha has said in it. So it's shorter. We don't read out the words today. But essentially, as you know, we have these sense bases, eye, ear, nose, tongue and body. They take in things. They soak up things. And they soak up. What do they soak up? They soak up sense objects. And that's when the mind is able to then soak in as well through these other sense bases. Now, the sense objects are forms cognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors or smells cognizable by the nose. We also have tastes which are cognizable by the tongue, touches or physical sensations that are cognizable by the body. And then, of course, you have ideas or thoughts that are cognizable by the mind. So our sense base is really eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and of course, mind. So the Buddha uses these 
sense bases, sense objects, and of course this entire sense faculty, as a way of explaining the difference between dwelling negligently and dwelling vigilantly and the results of that. So we've touched on this a little bit when we've talked about sense pleasures because we are always soaking in, taking in through our sense bases or sense faculties. And when that happens, we either experience pleasure or pain or neither pleasure nor pain. So something in the realm or region between those two extremes. The Buddha says when you dwell negligently, what you do is you're soaking in and you're taking in through your sense faculties. So the Buddha says your mind gets polluted with that contact. When you do that, the Buddha says there is no gladness, there is no rapture, and the body doesn't become tranquil. Instead, what happens is it becomes quite restless. The mind is always seeking out, searching, longing, yearning. And then, of course, when the body is not tranquil, it's too restless, you dwell with suffering. Now you dwell with dukkha because you haven't got what you want or what you have is declining in terms of that experience and you're longing and searching some more. So you're dwelling in dukkha, trying to hold on to something that can't last or still seeking for something because the pleasure went away. And so the Buddha says that the mind does not calm. It can't concentrate because it's restless and disturbed, troubled. And so then the Buddha says in terms of the spiritual teachings, the truth does not become apparent. You can't even see this process happen. And so then the Buddha says that is dwelling negligently. The contrast to that is vigilance. So with the same sense faculties, when you restrain, then you're not soaking in anything. You've actually got the security guard there and the mind is not getting polluted. It's not getting polluted with all the sense objects and the experience of that. So when the mind is unpolluted, the Buddha says, there is gladness, there is rapture. And then the body becomes tranquil because it's not searching, it's not restless, it's not troubled in the mind. And then, but the Buddha says you can dwell with happiness, with sukha. So it's a different kind of happiness that the Buddha is talking about here. It's one that is restrained, calm, content. And so when the mind is like that, then the mind is really what you call calm and concentrated. And then that's when you can see the truth of the Buddha's teachings, the truth of even not going out to sense pleasures not being attached to sense pleasures for seeking happiness. So that's what the Buddha calls dwelling vigilantly. So when you contemplate this, you really need to use an example. We could take chocolate cake. And I know this is an example I often use, but it's just easier to use a very simple example. So with chocolate cake, if you are yearning for chocolate cake, you want to go and see the chocolate cake, you want to go and taste the chocolate cake, you want to go and touch it, all kinds of things associated with that. The mind gets imbued with all these ideas and thoughts of wanting around it. So when you're not dwelling vigilantly, instead you're negligent, the mind you can see gets troubled, particularly if you can't go and get it. So there is no gladness, there is no rapture, the body doesn't become tranquil because you become agitated. I want, I want, I want. After a while, you experience the dukkha of it because you can't have it or you can't go and get it. You're agitated, you need some help to go and get it, something of that nature. And so the mind doesn't concentrate. So if you're trying to study or if you're trying to attend to some work and the mind is troubled by this idea of chocolate cake, then you can't calm the mind. Instead, it's restless. The truth, whether it's of the Buddha's teachings or of what you're trying to study or do, it's not apparent. And so this is dwelling negligently. Now, if you guard the senses, so if you don't turn on the TV and it doesn't show you a picture of the uh, chocolate cake, someone eating a chocolate cake, you see it in a TV program or it's on social media where there's cooking channels or someone who's indulging, or even a magazine where someone is doing something like that, then if you guard your sense faculties from looking at these things through those mediums, then what you find is maybe the mind doesn't even have a thought about chocolate cake. 
So the mind is unpolluted. It has no desires, no longings, no attachments. So in that case, the mind can be quite calm, quite settled. There can be gladness, there can be rapture, and the body stays quite tranquil because it's not being disturbed. So you can dwell in happiness in that sense. And if you're studying or working or trying to focus on something, you can concentrate the mind because it hasn't been led away. And so the truth becomes apparent, whether it's in a spiritual sense with the Buddha's teachings, or if it comes to if you're studying or working or something of that nature. And so that's what the Buddha means when you're dwelling vigilantly. The key about this story about Balanakatha festival is about negligence negligence towards doing things which are foolish, ignorant, things that are unsuitable. So if you see someone doing something unsuitable and you're not switched on to that, you would follow and do it. If your friends call you to come and do something that is outrageous, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be outrageous, it can be just under the banner of fun. But we don't see the distinction between negligence and vigilance and we go off with friends who are encouraging us to do unwholesome, unskillful things, to behave in a way that is not socially acceptable. But even if it is socially acceptable, so right now the temperature for things that people can do, some of these things are very outrageous and very unwholesome and very shameful. So even now, some of the things that may be considered socially acceptable are not really from the perspective of keeping our virtue. And that's something that is very useful to think about. Are the things that we do with our friends, sometimes with our families, is it suitable? Is it suitable if we're wanting to stay with an undisturbed mind and not to have so much longing and wanting and attachment to sensual pleasures? Things that are what the Buddha calls dangerous, leading to degradation, decline, leading to defilement. So it's a very interesting one to focus on, to look at, because there's things we do when we party with our friends. There's things that we do when we're drinking or going out with our friends that we think are safe, but maybe they're not. And maybe if we look at it also from the perspective of the people that have to endure our behavior, so if we go to a particular place, what about the people who are sitting near us? What about the people who have families with them? What if it was you sitting there not participating in the revelry, in the parting and the fun, but you're an observer? You have to endure someone else's behavior. So you can look at that like that mirror. You can either be the person who is sitting on the other side, having to endure other people's uh, shameless or unwise behavior, unskillful behavior. Or you could be the person participating in it and then you think what would it feel like for other people if I'm doing this? Would they like me if I'm doing this? Would they respect me if I'm doing this? Is this behavior unskillful, unwholesome? Can I look at myself and be okay with that? And if you're young usually it's what would my parents think? And so is it suitable to be wearing certain types of clothes? Is it suitable to be promiscuous? Is it suitable to be drinking in a particular way? So what is it like when my inhibitions are down? And that usually comes when you're taking something that is an intoxicant. And that is why the Buddha recommends not taking intoxicants, because they have this way of lowering our inhibitions. We start to have no shame, no fear of wrongdoing. And it's a very important one for each of us to learn that Taking intoxicants certainly has a way of lowering inhibitions and it's not a good thing. Each person needs to look for themselves, to test out, find out directly, is this a good thing to do? And why the Buddha teaches about dwelling negligently versus dwelling vigilantly. So in this Dhammapada verse, when the Buddha says that it's the ignorant and foolish person who engages in negligence, you can see why. They don't have a security guard in place when it comes to the sense faculties. And so they're quite okay with their inhibitions to be compromised when they have fun and they take intoxicants and 
those kinds of behavior. But the Buddha says that the wise, they protect vigilance. It's a treasure for them because they know that it means that they can dwell happily, that they can hold their head up high. There's no danger of being disrespected, no danger of being shamed, and no danger in terms of sensual pleasures. So this is one aspect of the teaching that is very important for us to look at, the connection between negligence and vigilance and the teaching of the Buddha here, but also the teaching that it's linked to sense restraint and the importance of sense restraint and seeing how that works, putting a security guard in place when it comes to the ear, eyes, nose, tongue, body and mind. We often get enticed when it comes to things through our sense faculties because we're sensual in nature because of the bodies we've created and so when you know that and you see the danger through the sense faculties you guard we've touched on this idea of moral shame and fear of wrongdoing and what's really interesting is another teaching of the buddha it's called the hiri otapa sutta this is Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 7, discourse number 65. And the Buddha uses this simile of the tree. And he often uses a simile of the tree because it's very useful to see when you're developing good qualities versus when you're developing not so good or bad qualities. So when there's a tree that has branches and foliage, its shoots, bark, softwood and heartwood grow to their fullness. That's what happens when you develop good qualities. The tree really flourishes and, and grows really well. But when the tree doesn't have those things, it doesn't have the branches and the foliage, so all the leaves and everything, then its shoots, bark, softwood and heartwood don't grow to their fullness. And it either stagnates or it actually dies. So, that simile is very helpful when Buddha talks about developing these good, skillful, wholesome qualities. So in this particular sutta, what's really interesting is that the proximate cause for sense restraint, so dwelling with vigilance, is moral shame and fear of wrongdoing. So the Buddha says, when there is a sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing, Restraint of the sense faculties possesses its proximate cause. Then the Buddha goes on to say, when there is restraint of the sense faculties, virtuous conduct possesses its proximate cause. And then it goes on to say some more, when there is virtuous conduct, right concentration possesses its proximate cause, and on and on it goes like that. But even with these first three links, you can see if you have a healthy sense of moral shame and you have a healthy sense of fear of wrongdoing, then you naturally want to put the security guard in place. You want to restrain the sense faculty so you don't get into trouble. And when you do that, that becomes the proximate cause for sila, for virtuous behavior, virtuous conduct. When you restrain, you know this is because I want to keep my sila, my precepts. I want to walk this path and make sure I don't get into trouble. I want to be able to err on the good side so the Buddha's path unfolds. And when you have this virtuous conduct, right concentration is there. And that's because with a purified mind, as the Buddha has said, even in the Pamata Vihari Sutta we just went through, you can easily concentrate the mind because it's not disturbed, it's not troubled, and on and on it goes. And so the opposite is when you don't have that moral shame and fear of wrongdoing, then you don't have any inclination to protect your sense faculties. You don't put security guards over the ear, eyes, nose, tongue, body and mind. You let the mind roam free. And when that's the case, your sealer goes. You, don't, you aren't able to protect your virtuous behavior. You tend to become heedless, pamata. And when you're heedless, you start behaving in the wrong way and saying the wrong things, such as those young people in the Balanakatha festival, they're yelling and screaming and disturbing people. So there's potentially divisive speech and 
harsh speech and frivolous talk, lots of horrible things. You harm people. And same in the mind. The mind is soaked in with all the unwholesome things. So when you don't have that virtuous behavior, virtuous conduct, how can you concentrate the mind and develop any, any better, whether it is in mundane things like studying and working and trying to succeed in those activities or other aspects of life or definitely in the spiritual life? How is it possible? And so that's the link. Moral shame and fear of wrongdoing has a very important place when it comes to dwelling vig vigilantly and being able to develop the mind and to have a healthy sense of sense restraint. That's the, probably the foremost of the links. Moral shame and fear of wrongdoing are the proximate cause for sense restraint. Let's talk a little bit more about moral shame and fear of wrongdoing. And the Buddha calls this two bright qualities. This is in the Charya Sutta on Guttu Nikaya chapter 2, discourse number 9. And the Buddha says, These two bright qualities protect the world. What two? Moral shame and fear of wrongdoing. If these two bright qualities did not protect the world, they would not be seen here and restraint regarding one's mother, aunt or wives of one's teachers and other respected people. The world would become promiscuous like goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, dogs and jackals. But because of these two bright qualities protecting the world, there is seen here restraint regarding one's mother, aunt or the wives of one's teachers and other respected people. So what's evident about this Buddha's teaching here is that moral shame and fear of wrongdoing, they're protectors. They guard the world against very shameful, very disgusting behavior. So in terms of promiscuity and uh, sexual matters, what the Buddha is saying here is that it protects people from having sex with the wrong kind of people, not behaving like animals. And one of the key things that is evident right now is that there is a lot of promiscuity, there is a lot of behavior which you can't really tolerate, particularly if you want to keep the mind bright and luminous. And of course, if you want to follow the Buddha's instructions and get out of this whole mass of suffering. So what's really important is to see moral shame and fear of wrongdoing in a very wholesome sense because it is what protects us. So if you think about our parents protecting us when we're young, they're there because they protect us from things which are harmful. In the same way, moral shame and fear of wrongdoing is doing the same thing. It's saying, stay away from that because it's dangerous for you. It will only lead to danger, decline and defilement. So, if you know that you want to keep virtue, then you know that moral shame is a very good thing. It's when that sense kicks in and it says, oh, not sure that should be doing that. What would people think? What would my parents think? What would my teachers think? What would the people who are wise and sensible, what would they think? That's moral shame. And then when it comes to fear of wrongdoing, it's like the consequences. And we've spoken about this in many different suttas, including when we've done the Vatupama Sutta, where you think, what has the Buddha said about the consequences of bad behavior? And of course, we know from various suttas that there are implications in this lifetime. You can be punished in this lifetime if you do something terrible, like kill someone or... Uh, harm someone, but also there are consequences of being told off and fined if you're taken to court or put in jail for something and various other things as well. And people shun you, people talk about you in not a nice way. And there are also consequences beyond this life. So we know that if you undertake unwholesome behavior, the Buddha says that when you die 
and with the breakup of the body after death, you reborn in a lower realm. And so that's not a good thing. And so that's when that healthy sense of fear of wrongdoing kicks in. You, you think about the consequences of things. And so you steer clear because you understand through moral shame and fear of wrongdoing that this is not to be engaged in. One should be quite vigilant. The Buddha does see the value of these bright qualities. And you can see that because in other suttas, the Buddha talks about the power of moral shame and the wealth of moral shame. And the teaching in it is the same. So I've just put it on this one slide where the Buddha says, and what is the power of moral shame? And of course, the same thing. And what is the wealth of moral shame? And the Buddha says here, a noble disciple has a sense of moral shame. They are ashamed of bodily, verbal and mental misconduct. They are ashamed of acquiring bad, unwholesome qualities. This is called the power of moral shame. And this is called the wealth of moral shame. So that's when your healthy sense of uh, moral shame, it kicks in. Where you think, oh, I feel so shameful to be doing this by body, speech and mind. And sometimes it helps to think, what would people think? What would the Buddha think if they were observing this behavior? What would the Arahants think if they were observing this behavior? Is this suitable? And of course, in a worldly sense, what would my parents think? Would they be ashamed? Would they be upset? And you don't want to acquire it out of wisdom, these bad qualities, because it leads to more bad. And the Buddha says the same thing about fear of wrongdoing. It's a power and also it's a wealth. And this is probably the healthiest kind of fear that one can have. It's fear of the consequences, fear of the ramifications when we have bad behavior. So of course there are other kinds of fear where you're fearful because you're scared, you're fearful of losing your belongings, all those kinds of fears which are different. But this is the healthiest kind of fear. So the Buddha says, and what is the power of fear of wrongdoing? And what is the wealth of fear of wrongdoing? And the Buddha's answer in both cases is, a noble disciple fears wrongdoing. They are fearful of bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. They are fearful of acquiring bad, unwholesome qualities. Now, the reason for that is because of the consequences in this lifetime and in the next. So in this lifetime, it's fear of going to prison, being prosecuted, being accused, being reprimanded, told off, being shouted at. And in the future, it's about being reborn in lower realms, bearing the consequences of very poor virtue in this lifetime. And so this is a very healthy one to have because when that kicks in before you do anything, or even while you're doing something that is not necessarily good for you, or for anyone else, it's very useful because it prevents you or even stops you as you are doing it. And even looking back where you've done something like that and you regret, it's very, very helpful because then you know, I don't want to do that again and you make a resolution. And so you can see why these are bright qualities because they're preventative preventative measures, protective measures that help us to help us to stay on the path that is wholesome and good. So naturally the Buddha has these other good things to say about moral shame and fear of wrongdoing. From the suttas you can see the Buddha says that one can dwell happily when you have these qualities, that it leads to the non-decline of a trainee. So someone who is training on the Buddha's path these are the qualities that help you to progress, not to decline. It also says that you're deposited in heaven as if you're brought there. So that's very helpful. That means you would ascend upwards rather than going to lower realms. And again, yes, the Buddha says that you'll be reborn in a good destination. And then the Buddha also says you can live with ease rather than with debt, poor and impoverished. So there's a sutta that we'll be looking at in more detail in another session. This is the inner sutta. That's where the Buddha says that. And the Buddha also says that you're agreeable to your spiritual companions. 
So you're doing things that are not harmful to yourself, but they're also not harmful to anybody else. So you're not being someone who is making it difficult for others with your poor behavior, where they become ashamed of you or where they don't want to be around you. And so when you have this healthy sense of moral shame and fear of wrongdoing, you're agreeable to those people. They want to be around you because they know that you're respectable and you have good virtuous conduct as a result of these bright qualities. And then the other thing that the Buddha says about these two qualities is that they're two of seven kinds of wealth that cannot be taken away by fire, water, kings, thieves, and displeasing heirs. So usually when it comes to wealth, material wealth, it can be taken from you. So you can see even in the world right now, there are banks that are shutting down people's accounts. The government is making these rules. Uh, there are also floods and uh, natural disasters which are taking away people's homes. There are fires that do those things. There are thieves that come and steal from you. So wealth can be taken, material wealth can be taken in that way. Or you could lose your money on the stock market or another kind of investment. But when it comes to moral shame and fear of wrongdoing as two bright qualities, no one can ever take that away from you because that's yours in the sense of you have developed this healthy sense of moral shame, this power, this wealth. And the same with the fear of wrongdoing. Through wisdom, you know right from wrong. You know the consequences. So when you listen to the Buddha's teachings this way, you think, wow, it's actually something that's very, very helpful, beneficial to everyday life and also to what is beyond this particular life. If we come back to the Dhammapada verse and the Buddha is saying in terms of this story of the Balanakatha festival, and he says to engage in negligence is for ignorant and foolish people, while vigilance for the wise is protected as the foremost wealth, do not engage in negligence nor be intimate with attachment to sensual pleasures. Being vigilant and meditative, one attains great happiness. So you can see when you go back to this saying of the Buddha, much of what we've talked about is rolled up in here and we can understand why the Buddha is saying ignorant and foolish people engage in negligence and it leads to downfall, it leads to shamefulness and lack of a fear of wrongdoing. Like they don't have that and so they continue to perpetuate that kind of behavior and it's not something to be happy about it's something to be worried about if you're that kind of person doing that it doesn't lead to good things whereas the wise you can see vigilance is what protects that's why it's the foremost wealth and so they protect vigilance and ensure that they're not intimate with sensual pleasures seeing the danger in sensual pleasures the more you get wrapped up in sensual pleasures, it leads to a lot of negligence. And so the whole thing starts to spiral. So this is something that we can take away from this story of Balanakatha festival. And in your own time, look at your own examples. Look at the type of example you want to be in the world. Do you want to be a shining light in the world, setting a good example for others? Or do you want to be like these young foolish people who attended the festival. And when people look in the paper and read news about this kind of activity and they frown on it, they're troubled by it, they don't have any respect for people participating in these sorts of things, young and old, then you think, you think, is this something that is suitable for me? We can end our session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem. Wishing you well. Veruan Saranai.